PhotoShelter is the leader in online portfolio websites and tools for professional photographers. We help you get business, do business, and keep business. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Alan Murabayashi speaking to you from sunny and very hot New York. Uh, and I have the pleasure of having uh, two people from different parts of the world. Uh, Amy Vitali is joining us from Montana, and Elizabeth Dalziel is joining us from London. But before we do the intros with them, a few housekeeping notes. Over on the right of your computer, you should be seeing a go to webinar control panel. And from that panel, you can ask us questions as we go along. And we'll try to intersperse those questions into the conversation. I should also let you know that we are recording this. So in case you have to drop out or you're having audio problems, uh, you can always find this on our blog tomorrow at blog.photoshelter.com. And lastly, uh, if you are so inclined to, or if you're one of those Twitter people, we have a hashtag, uh, hashtag PS webinar, and you can also uh, talk to us at PhotoShelter. Um, so get out your little mobile devices and start tweeting away. And with that, let me first introduce Amy Vitali all the way from Montana. Hello, Amy. <laughs> Hello, good afternoon. <laughs> and from London, Elizabeth, how are you? Oh, I'm doing very well, thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, so, Amy, why don't we do the, uh, I mean, Amy's work I've been seeing for well over a decade. Why, Amy, why don't you give us kind of the, the rundown on where you've been and, and why you're here today? Well, um, you know, it's I've been in a lot of places, and basically I just felt, I think, with recent news and, and just that it's time to talk about um, being a woman, traveling, and, and basically I don't want today to be about, you know, scaring people and thinking that, you know, the world is a scary place and that you shouldn't travel because, frankly, the kindness of strangers is real. I entirely rely on that. Um, it's a wonderful world out there, and I want to encourage especially female photographers to get out there. We need your voices and viewpoint. But there are definitely things you can do to be a little bit safer and be thoughtful about the way you work, and that's really the motivation for today. And Amy is off to Kenya for about a month tomorrow, so she continues her travels uh, to different parts of the world. Uh, Elizabeth is joining us from London. Elizabeth has also been everywhere in the world, including Southeast Asia and North Korea and uh, China. Um, Elizabeth, welcome. Oh, hello. Um, I'm pleased to be with all of you and uh, hopefully, like Amy said, can also shed some lights of um, ways to keep safe and keep your wits about uh, not only when traveling abroad but you know when tr when working at home uh, we were speaking right before the panel began about how uh, seemingly innocent situations you know covering your own neighborhood can you know sometimes uh, become not so innocent so it's it's always to to focus whether the story's abroad or at home that every story is local and it's good to uh, acquire local knowledge. Yeah, and I think that's a good point. So we do have two very accomplished female photojournalists uh, on, on the line today and talking about, you know, some specific issues that women will run into wherever they are. But um, we do want to make the point that that wherever you go in the world, whether it's the south side of Chicago or uh, New Orleans or, or China or India, um, there are risks, obviously, everywhere you go and so a lot of the things that you guys are going to be talking about are applicable to any situation where you're unfamiliar with the territory unfamiliar with the customs or just feel kind of you know that the hair sticking up on the back of your neck a little bit I guess that point yeah. that you make about the hair sticking up in the back of your neck I think is very very important because you should always follow your gut instinct that's going to be the most important thing yeah, and you know, I would have to throw in there too that I think often the most dangerous situations can be in your back backyard when you're sort of lulled into this false sense of security. And, and those, you know, don't ever assume that any situation is safe. Like when you're working, you really need to be on all the time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I was writing one of our new uh, New York City bike shares to the office today. <laughs> Probably almost got hit about three times because I was just not focused on the road. So I think you're absolutely <laughs> right. It's kind of when you're not, you know, when you when the guard's down a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, Amy has provided us with some photos from from different places and maybe you can walk us through kind of the situations and, and some situational awareness that you may have had or may have not had in these when you were taking these photos. 
Okay, well, this, this image right here is from Gujarat um, during some really um, terrible rioting where um, thousands of people died in a span of a few days. And, um, you know, when I was working there, I was told um, I shouldn't be there, I would be raped. And, um, and the irony was that a lot of my male colleagues had all their gear stolen and got into trouble. And um, maybe because I was hyper, well, lucky too. I mean, I, I think some amount of luck and um, just hyper vigilant. I had a, a minder with me always. Um, we're going to talk about some of these details, but we just wanted to give a sense of our work and the different types of situations we've worked in. So we can. I mean, this situation this. doesn't look that dissimilar from kind of the scene I saw down at Zuccotti Park with Occupy Wall Street. I mean, you're seeing kind of a heavily militarized presence and I guess their main job is intimidation almost. Yeah, and you know, to be honest, that last photo um, was probably a, a quieter moment. It was yeah. much more violent than that and I was just looking for sort of scenes of hope within the, the madness. Um, and this is in Afghanistan. Um, and again, you know, it's about um, respecting culture and um, and and respecting um, and sort of following the protocol wherever you may be, um, because if you have the support and um, of, of the authority in that place, very often um, everybody else will not harass you, knowing that the head honcho in wherever you're working is. Um, has allowed you to be there. So we, again, will go into more detail about these these individual things. I, I've seen you wear uh, headscarves when you're traveling around. How, how sensitive, you know, when you talk about culture and kind of assimilation, are you with things like wardrobe? Oh, that, you know, that's something I definitely wanted to get into more. I mean, I dress very, very conservatively wherever I go. And um, and I always carry a headscarf, even if you don't use the headscarf. It, I mean, it's this. It's so handy to have. You can cover up your um, your camera if it's raining. I mean, there's so many. But but mostly, it's about respecting the culture. So I usually buy local clothes in conservative places, um, and you know, just uh, don't, you know, don't. I think a lot of women don't realize that even a top without sleeves is offensive in a lot of places and no shorts definitely don't bring shorts ever um, and then you know I don't wear jewelry no makeup I really just try to blend in and be as boring as possible mm -hmm. another uh, small just just uh, something which occurred to me uh, at one time when I was caught out without a headscarf uh, don't um, don't hesitate to ask the local women if they could, if you could borrow to a borrow headscarf one. as well. Yeah, they'll be, mm -hmm. they'll look on it as a sign of respect and, and also it, it creates um, an ally out of the local women, just if you happen to be caught without a headscarf. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and if you realize you step outside and you realize that it's a lot more conservative, go back right away and change or go buy clothes. I mean, it's just do not worry about um, <laughs> looking pretty or something like that. I just think yeah. just be, you know, really just try to blend in. The other thing is a lot of single women go out there and you will be asked all the time whether you're married or in India, for example, the rickshaw drivers would also, the code for them was, do you like to drink whiskey? And, you know, for them, that meant that you were a loose woman. Yeah. So, um, I, you know, wear, think about wearing a wedding ring if you want, but, um, you know, just, um, again, it's, it's being really um, conservative in everything that you do. You know, both of you are, are white women with American accents. Um, you, you, you try to uh, dress conservatively and appropriately for any given country or region that you're in, but you still can't get around that, that fact that you're kind of sticking out, right? I mean, it's, there's still the reality of that situation. Oh, definitely. You know, I'm, I'm <laughs> I, I stick out everywhere, but, um, but I, it's interesting, even the way people respond to you when you take the time to respect their culture, they, 
they are they open up and show you their lives and it, it, it's you know imagine somebody coming here and and wearing a burqa um you know that you'd look at them strangely well it's exactly the same in reverse yeah so um elizabeth here is a uh, a pretty dramatic photo <clears throat> that you that you shot Yes, this, this was in Gaza, and it was um, all of a sudden, um, uh, this is an active firefight, and as you see, there are children, uh, you, wouldn't, you, you couldn't see women, but there were, you know, women about, and, uh, you know, although we're not specifically talking about a situation of, you know, a gun battle or conflict, if you happen to be caught in in a situation like this, secure a safe place. Um, always look for an exit, a way you can, if the situation gets even worse, keep low to the ground as people are doing in this specific situation because you tend to shoot, uh, you know, from with your gun at the waist up. But, um, mm -hmm. but uh, and if you don't need to be there, uh, don't be there, get a vantage point, step away from a situation. Again, like we said, use your intuition and, and, um, uh, I, this happened to me as well, and uh, Amy had mentioned this. A lot of the times, the men are fighting in the main street, and you will find the women inside. And you can um, knock on a door, and the women will... I had a, a case in Ramallah where I was shooting during a riot, and the situation got quite bad. And the women themselves called me, called me in. To, and being a woman, there's this kind of sisterhood that develops, yeah. and, and it was... Um, it was actually, they said, oh, let the men fight and, and you know, come and have tea with us. <laughs> right, and there was a, right. a, 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 you know, a gun battle outside and they were pretty much like, oh, let them carry on with that. So, so uh, uh, again, you know, it, in situations sometimes being a woman can work in your favor because you're not as, you know, I'm not saying this is the case always and I'm sure there are, you know, um, you know, I'm not trying to be gender biased, but when you can, use it to your advantage. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. You know, I watch a lot of these uh, documentaries on the Discovery Channel about, you know, the training of the Navy SEALs, etc., and so much about their ability to react in a high-pressure situation is because they, they rehearse uh, scenarios where they're, you know, busting into a house or, or whatnot. How, how did you prepare yourself to be in a situation like this? Was it the first time you froze up and, and eventually you kind of got your bearings, stay low, find a safe place? Or do you think it's just kind of part of the DNA of who you are and that's why you're out there taking these photos? You know, I think it's a combination of things. Uh, I would say in my case, uh, it had to do with, you know, you build up your experience. You also, uh, there are always, uh, you know, if there are colleagues around you that are more experienced than you are that know you know, ask for their advice, work in groups, sometimes that's very, very helpful. And also something which, uh, in my case, I was working for a large company at the time uh, for the Associated Press, and they provided us with uh, training in a hostile environment course, which was very useful just to know the basics of how to react in hostile situations. Mm -hmm. And um, there are, if you don't have as a freelancer, the backup of an infrastructure like this, there are foundations um, uh, and resources that you could go to where they will provide funding uh, for you to train um, with professionals, sometimes ex-military that will, um, or ex-security ex forces that will show you what to do. Like in, in this picture, uh, I could have just walked in, but you've got to look for trip wires. You've got to see that the structure is safe, you know, because there could be a booby trap when you go yeah. in there. And um, it, you could be maimed or killed in something that seems like, you know, like there's no evident danger or there's not shelling at that moment or shelling can commence again. So, I mean, a, a lot of these guidelines, um, you know, you learn by... Uh, attending these courses. There's also a huge amount of information online, um, it, it, you know, on how s some of the points I, I actually think are are listed in, in one of the resources that um, uh, f um, are, are named in the bullet points. Or, or if not, we, we will be glad to provide them towards the end. Yeah, we have it but, in the, in the, later in the talk for exactly. sure. Exactly. 
can can I throw in one thing there before? Yeah, please. Oh, sorry, sure. just about the the um, you know not having, for example, if you're not, for women out there that may not even be covering conflict, super important as a freelancer to have insurance, health insurance, because, you know, anything can go, go wrong. So it's not just hostile training courses, but it's just for even women doing other kinds of stories. Um, you need to pay and, and, you know, at least have the, the ability to pay for the basic things like mm -hmm. health insurance. What what sort of uh, places do you think it's important to have this this kind of external training? You know, there's so many freelancers now because of the the budget situation with major publications. So a lot of freelancers are going into hairy situations. But why would I not take a training course if I'm going into Chicago? But I might take it if I'm going into the Middle East. What what sort of the calculus that you guys are going through to say this is a little more dicey uh, more dicey of a proposition? I, I would say, it, well, in, in my case in particular, all the training that you can get your hands on uh, is, is um, if, if available, you should try and acquire skills. Even uh, in, in your hometown, like it, um, it, say in Chicago or in Mexico or wherever it is you are, if, if, you, if you have that additional uh, knowledge of, say, first aid, which is something that is provided in these courses. You can help a colleague. You can help yourself. Um, a lot of the things that are, are reviewed in these courses aren't necessarily just to do with warfare. Uh, so right. if, if you are able to, to get the training, it can help you in, in some cases even save a life. I mean, if that sounds, uh, I know it sounds a bit dramatic, but. Uh, uh, no. Yeah, it. I totally agree with you. And I mean, frankly, um, sometimes you know, even working on a ranch in Montana, the you know stuff can happen. And the yeah. more knowledge you, I mean, just basic things. Um, it it's worth your time to sort of research and find if you can do a local CPR course. Um, so or how to use a tourniquet, how to treat somebody yes. who's fallen off a horse, and right. you know not further uh, harm their spine if they've had an injury. Um, yeah, things as, as basic as that. So we're looking at this particular uh, uh, photo that Elizabeth took of a, a baby funeral. And I, I want to take just a, a slight diversion, which is with all of the situational awareness that you have to have in the back of your head, how do you also balance sort of the Ethics is probably not the right word, too strong word, but but sort of the veracity of the scene. Now, I've personally given up on you know the whole objectivity of of photography, et cetera. But you know, we've seen baby photos in the past that have been construed as being uh, you know having propaganda um, type motives for the people that are actually doing it. So, what's going through your head when you see a scene like this? Are you even thinking about that, or is that something you think about when you're looking at the photos later on? I basically, when, when I go into a situation, A, I try not to affect the situation. I try to be as invisible as possible. And I, I never suggest, I never alter. Uh, I basically am, you know, attempt to be as much as I can just there to, to document what is happening. Uh, and, and try, I know there is no, you know, you will always have a point of view and you can't remain 100% objective from the time you frame something. But within, you know, the range that where I am able to, 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 to do so, I, I try to not influence what is occurring in front of me. I don't know mm -hmm. what you do. Amy, is that your approach to this? Uh, oh, and absolutely. And But also, do you do realize, Alan, sometimes that, you know, you're a tool on every side of these conflicts. And, yeah. you know, you, you just have to sort of know that and try to keep it balanced and, yes. and understand when, you know, when you're just another <laughs> tool in the big machine. Um, and, and in that respect, are you are you seeking permission to shoot these photos when you're in kind of a, a, a dicey situation? I would say it's always good to, um, you know, whether it's with the local elders or, you know, if there is a figure of authority, it's always good to make, make yourself, you know, it, it's, it's never good to go 
into a situation where you haven't been authorized to be in. I mean, if you can, um, because it will it will work against you more if you don't speak the language. Mm -hmm. And if, you know, it's a situation where there's a crowd, the crowd can turn on you. I mean, there's a, I, I would say if it's possible to get authorization from, from the people, work with the people uh, rather than try to sly, them being sly. It's, it always works better to be honest and, and forward. And another thing, just stepping a, Go, going a, a few steps back on altering the situation, I had, I don't know if Amy had this occur to me. Sometimes when people see cameras, they can start to act up. I've, I've seen in situations in riot where young men have, you know, started throwing rocks at soldiers or trying to do something because they saw that I was, that there was right. a, an audience and a camera there. I would say, because I would be endangering that person's life or I would be, you know, and this could be any kind of um, situation. It doesn't necessarily need to, you know, have to do with war. But if you see that you yourself are altering a situation, I would try and take a step back just for, as you mentioned before, veracity and not trying to be the story about you covering or documenting something because the story is, it's not about you. It's about what you are covering. Yeah, if you, you just know, joined us, uh, we are talking to Amy Vitali and Elizabeth Alziel about uh, kind of safety uh, in, in photographing in dangerous places. And uh, for those of you that are tweeting, the hashtag is PSWebinar. Amy, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to add, Elizabeth, that is such an interesting point. And it was actually um, in Gaza that was a big turning point in my own career with exactly that scene of kids throwing rocks and it escalating very quickly to kids getting shot. And I realized that the media um, is, you know, you can become a part of um, really inflaming and encouraging situations to get out of control. And I had to ask myself at that point, um, was it was it fair and and you know and honestly there's so many other aspects to these stories and that's also something I would like to touch on today is that um, there's beautiful even more meaningful imagery um, as a woman that you can get um, that aren't on the front lines and you don't exactly. you know you don't need to be up there and and actually um, one more quick story um, same thing in in Gaza where I didn't trust my instincts one one sort of late afternoon when the sun was about to set and there it was a funeral and um, you know there was a lot of anger in the crowd and um, all of a sudden this crazy guy who looked like Rambo started screaming CIA CIA and um, it the situation got out of hand so quickly and the only thing that saved me that day was the fact that I had spent the entire day with a group with all the women up in their house that that Elizabeth was just talking about and they were at the end of this procession and and came and rescued me and so again um, I learned you know I was really lucky learned an important lesson but it is so much about building relationships and trusting your instincts and not trying to get you know these you don't need to be in the center of the frenzy right, um, right. especially when that, you don't have the right backup that plan. is a very very good point and we uh, um, uh, Amy and myself were discussing this early uh, earlier um, when you, which tends to happen, uh, uh, if somebody gropes you, if somebody touches you uh, while you're working or something like that, think first of all, do I need this picture? And can you move away from a crowd? Because there is nothing more dangerous in a crowd. Try to work, if you have a, a, a local fixer, try to work with a local fixer next to you. I've had situations you know, uh, 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 in Looters Market in Iraq where one person groped me, it was followed by another hand and then another hand and the situation got out of control so fast despite my wearing a full hijab, I was completely covered. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, your face like is, is, is foreign, it is not a local face. Yeah. And I was lucky enough that between my driver and my fixer, they were, and the fact that they spoke um, Arabic and summoned a few other men that were there and they managed to pull me out 
of there if if you when, whenever you can if you're in a situation of a mob think do I really need to be there mm -hmm. and can I get the picture you know rather you know from a vantage point or like Amy said you know try and find a more intimate another picture that you know might tell the story in a different way you don't always need to be in the thick of it to yeah. tell the story yeah. and sometimes and it's it's nice to get the other side definitely and the funny thing is by the way I just want to point out those those mob groping scenes are not um, isolated to the Middle East they happen all over the world yes. and you have a few moments you can if your intuition is there and you sense it you can see the mood changing you can see it building so there is time to get out of it before it gets to that dangerous point most of the time and and that's something I wanted I want us to discuss is just your intuition and noticing yeah. you know what half the time our camera is just in I mean our eyes inside the camera you're not you know able to pay attention to everything going on around you so um, one thing um, Elizabeth and I both do is you know we we hire a local to be with us to be another eye that's always got our back and looking around in those situations if you're in the thick of it um, but but you you know also take the camera down every now and again and look around you without having it pressed up against your face because mm -hmm. you've got to be aware um, of all those little things happening the mood will there'll be signals that and will alert you to a changing dynamic to add uh, add to that also if you don't speak the language it is crucial to get somebody who does because somebody could be saying next to you oh look at her you know somebody could yeah. be and your fixer will pick it up right away well you as a foreigner might, you know or somebody that doesn't speak the language might not I mean I I was in a situation when I was pulled out of a car and luckily I was with a local cameraman that was able to negotiate for me as I was being dragged away um, because he spoke the language and after that since I invested uh, three years I spent three years in the in in, um, in in the post where I was in the Middle East I took time to try and learn as much of the language as I could because sometimes even a few phrases could help you out Mm -hmm. One of the reasons uh, we're talking about this stuff today is in part because, and I've lost my source, but 2012 was the most, the deadliest year for journalists uh, since they've been keeping track. And I think it was something like 60 so journalists were killed uh, in 2012. And, and Amy brought to our attention here a number of situations where photographers uh, just in the past year, uh, here's a situation in India that, that Amy, you were mentioning uh, earlier. Yeah. Um, so this one hit home to a lot of us because, um, you know, a lot of the, we're talking about uh, a young woman who was um, raped in, you know, fairly, um, you know, in, in Mumbai, which is a, you know, it's a big metropolis and, and people were shocked by this. But the interesting thing about the scenario, I mean, I had been in so many situations like this where, you know, you're going into a, a place and, and a group of people will come up and say, you need permission, come with us. And, yes. and I want to go through exactly what you do in, in this sort of situation. You know, you don't, I mean, not to say, I mean, this, this girl did all the things she should have done. She had a male colleague with her. She thought she was being smart. It was not dark. Um, she did all the right things. But there are a couple of things to think about. Um, again, I think I mentioned it earlier. Sometimes having a big guy with you lulls you into that false sense of security. And always have an exit strategy. Don't go into these places. And the first thing I do when somebody says, you need permission, I say, well, where are your credentials? You show yes. me your credentials. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, if the place looks isolated and sketchy, I'm like no way I'm not going in there you can bring your guy out here yeah. and um, you know frankly you can always go back you do not need to be very often those pictures you think you need them but if you really assess it they're not even going to be that great and just don't put yourself in those dangerous isolated places where you know th these things happen I think something that we, you need to remember is is 
no photo is worth your life or your right. I, I know it sounds you know oh this photo is worth that there is no photo worth dying for and yeah. you know dead photographers don't you know you, there's it's there's no picture that you need so badly that you need to put yourself in harm's way to get it. Yeah. And here are two more situations where male photographers uh, were either attacked or, or killed. So obviously it's not just a female photographers are more vulnerable in the field. Everyone's a, a potential target. Of course. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think the one thing, you know, I want to stress is be confident and push back when people they'll try to intimidate you and and you know it's just sort of turning the coin and saying you know no I'm not gonna go there no I'm not gonna do that and if you are you know sort of in a situation where always stay behind them have an exit strategy stay behind so you can run away if you need to don't get blocked in um, uh we have a great question from Bev, and, and I know uh, Amy was just named a Nikon ambassador, um, but I'm wondering, you know, I know Alex Majoli from uh, from Magnum used, you know, these small Olympus point-and-shoots for, for many years, and I'm wondering with the, all of the options for sort of mirrorless cameras where you guys have considered using just smaller cameras so you don't look like a professional out there in the field or whether, you know, it's obvious you're in a conflict situation, so get the best equipment you can have. Well, for me personally, I'm, I've really taken a step away and I'm not doing those conflict zones. I'm interested in different kinds of stories now. Um, so, but I, but you know, that's why I really wanted to make this webinar much more than just conflict photography because yeah. you can get in trouble in everyday situations if, as we've already said. And so, um, to answer that question, no, you know, I don't really, um, you, you know, I'm, I, I haven't switched um, to other cameras, but I know plenty of people are, for example, in um, Syria and all of these places using iPhones and small cameras for sure. <laughs> Elizabeth, are, are I you? Think, yeah, no, I, I would say in my case, same as Amy, I've, you know, I, I figure I'm not really going to blend in uh, one way or the other if right. needed. <laughs> right. uh, it, yeah, if, I, I still remember one of my colleagues, uh, we were in Tibet, uh, you know, uh, it, during the situation in uh, Shiahe when there were, you know, the, um, uh, there were problems between the Tibetans and the Chinese authorities and there was being a clampdown. And I yelled something to a colleague that was down the street and he's blonde, blue eyes, and he turns around and tells me, don't speak to me in English. We're trying to blend in. And right. I just looked at us and thought, okay, <laughs> we're, we're not going to blend in, in, you know, and, and sometimes, it, you know, not trying to blend in makes you, you know, look like you're not trying to sneak around uh, <laughs> right. and, yeah. and be pointed out like a spy or whatnot. But right. I think you've got to, again, you know, trust your instinct. And if you can use a G10 or a G12, I don't know up to what number the Gs are. Or right. if, if, you know, you can use an iPhone or a small digital device that will... I, I've been in situations, um, you know covering um, just like in Mexico, a local, um, I embedded myself with, with a, a, a drug unit and, and they ended up uh, busting a, a, a coke lab and I had a smaller camera because they told me it would put them at risk. So they asked me if I, if I could use no flash in a smaller camera and, and you know, in that case I did. Uh, so it depends on what situation you're working in. Uh, yeah and what your subjects are mo more comfortable with. Like Amy said, it doesn't need to be um, conflict. And I know excellent projects that have been done, you know, with iPhones. Uh, I mean, I've got colleagues, you know, David Gudenfelder, uh, uh, Kochi Hernandez, also from the San Jose Mercury, does amazing things with iPhones. So mm -hmm. I would say use whatever resources you have uh, yeah. and you feel, you know, tell your story best. And, and one thing, I, I, Alan, I want to say, I think when you're a photojournalist, like, own it. You know, I, yeah. I don't want to be surreptitious. I let everybody, and we're going to get into this right now, which is I let everybody know why I'm there. Because when I am endorsed and accepted by the community, I get great access. It doesn't matter. I could carry a bazooka 
sized, you know, camera and it wouldn't matter. I mean, I'm exaggerating here, but but it's not about the gear. It really mm -hmm, isn't. Mm -hmm. It's about establishing, um, you know, Trust. the very first thing, right, as, and creating relationships. It has nothing to do with your gear. It's all about the relationships. And the stronger relationships you have in where, at whatever community you're working in, the safer you're going to be and your pictures are going to be better. Exactly. You'll get more access. You'll get a much more intimate and real image of what is is really going on more than you know just what you would be able to get by trying to go undercover or behind uh, when when I'm again if if that is possible but definitely what Amy pointed out it's always best to 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 be honest about what you're doing right yeah. right and we and have a, a pre-flight uh, checklist here uh, and obviously again since so many people are, are freelancers nowadays and you don't have this, the total institutional support that you might have had a decade ago uh, this mm -hmm. list becomes even more important yeah and this is a really good list to think about you know very often um, I get letters all the time from from really from strangers saying you know hey I'm going to Kenya or I'm going here do you know any you know, local NGOs or contacts or fixers. And, and that's what I encourage all of you to do. There is a whole world of resources out there. And before you even book your plane ticket, you should be, you know, on the internet, contacting people, getting on Skype, making calls, establishing a network before you even set foot in that country. Or, all the work that you do ahead yeah. of time will save you time when you get there and it will allow you it will save you money time effort and it will make you more more secure it's always better to go with a structure behind you if that is possible right and one thing I also wanted to say don't trust just anybody go through somebody you you know a reputable person somebody that you know you trust to get those leads because I've actually ended up with stalkers following me around mm -hmm. you know <laughs> because um, they they said oh I worked with the BBC and um, you know and and you just assume everything at face value don't do that go through you know I mean like stalkers is a great place um, Elizabeth mentioned vulture club but um, Try to find people in the business who you respect and and do the research you need to do. Have you generally found that that young photographers who are looking for this advice that that more senior photographers like yourselves are pretty open with dispensing information about these these places? Happily, the happily, happily. I love to give work to fixers who are good. They want it. You know, they need that work too. And if they're really, you know, <laughs> trust trusting and um, yeah, or, or I mean, just there's a lot of hardworking, trustworthy people out there that I would hold, and we would all recommend them with joy. If you um, can, yeah. oh, sorry, no, I, I was going to say something that happens sometimes when you arrive to a place, you get a taxi driver at the airport, and he's like, "Oh, my cousin is a good, you know, a <laughs> excellent fixer," or something like that. When you can get a recommendation don't just go with somebody who seems a very nice guy and uh, in the end you might end up with a stalker you might end up with somebody who doesn't know what they're doing you might end up with somebody who actually might be a threat to you himself so mm -hmm. try when possible to get a fixer and a driver that somebody else has used uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and the other thing is, Elizabeth, I think a lot of freelancers are probably thinking, well, I can't afford that. I can't afford that. You know, if you get in touch with them in advance, you can negotiate with them. So, you know, it, it, and, and as we mentioned before, um, it's a much greater, you know, don't be um, penny wise, pound foolish or whatever that quote is. I mean, it is worth your safety to have somebody lined up there and same thing with hotels like find out places which are you know safe and and they don't have to be expensive but you want a safe place to stay and um, can I just talk about hotels really quickly sure yes. one thing when you get check into a hotel as a single woman you know ask to see the room make sure it's 
first of all, not on the ground floor where somebody can break in. Secondly, not off in some remote corner so that if somebody does break in, nobody will hear you if you're, you know, trying to get help. Um, and, and thirdly, you know, I've had really weird situations where, you know, you just want to check that out and make sure that the hotel is safe and that the room is safe and you haven't, um, you know, again, other little things have happened to me in hotels where, you know, at 11 o'clock at night, the quote unquote management will come up and say, I need your passport. Right. And don't ever open the door, even if it seems like the most reasonable thing. Just tell them, I will bring it down in the morning. Same thing if you even order food. Don't let the person bringing the food into your room in some of these sketchy places. Like, just let them um, stand in the doorway and take it from them, or, or um, but don't, don't ever, or just stand outside the door while they put it in your room. Don't be caught. Don't, I know it sounds a little paranoid, but I do that out of, you know, just knowing that you you don't know in any situation. Also, Elizabeth, can you give us the 30-second the job description of what a fixer does? Uh, a fixer is somebody that has local knowledge that can take you um, to what the, you know, basically he has the contacts, he has a geographical uh, layout of you know, places where you might need to go and where you can find the story. He will be your translator. He will be your eyes on the ground. He can, um, uh, uh, oh gosh, a, yeah, a, a fixer, a fixer can save your life. Uh, and um, I don't know, um, gosh, what, what can a fixer do for you? Um, and, and typically, what are we spending to, per day for a fixer? What's the it depends where you are, though. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it, it changes all over the world. And frankly, just ask people online or get in touch with um, local journalists and ask them what the going rate. Frankly, go, finding local journalists is, is um, one of the best things, too. You can often work with them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, I'm a, I, I travel a lot globally. I'm, I'm obviously not a photojournalist, but you know, the, they, they typically tell you to pay attention to things like State Department warnings, et cetera. I, I assume those are very conservative war warnings compared to the, the types of situations that you might want to shoot as a photographer, as a working photojournalist. Do you guys look at those State Department warnings at all? Or are you reading that kind of stuff? Or are you really looking <laughs> at the locals on the ground? I'm looking at the locals on the ground. Okay. Yeah, I, I would say the locals on the ground are, are much more way to go. And what Amy pointed out about um, going sometimes to the local newspaper uh, or a local <laughs> magazine uh, can, can work uh, wonders for you uh, because the journalists tend to, you know, cover the stories that you might be interested in. Also, sometimes working, you know, with a, a local grassroots NGO, um, you know, whether it be UNHCR or, well, UNHCR is a huge one, but they can lead you in the direction of, of what you need to find, and they work for accredited association, um, mm -hmm. uh, and a credible association as well, rather than just getting somebody from the street. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so here's a list of uh, preparedness items, uh, and we've talked about a few of them, but Amy, why don't you take us through the list? Yeah, I mean, have accreditation. And frankly, I don't like to carry a business card because, again, you're opening yourself up to unwanted um, stalkers, potentially, if you have your address and phone number on there. Um, so have accreditation that you can show rather than handing out a business card. And, and if you have a business card, try not to put your personal phone number or address on it because that might, you know, you might have unsolicited um calls or somebody trying to contact you uh, or contact your family. Um, and definitely. And that, you know, just one really quick point about that. Be really careful about, every, you know, I remember when I first moved um, abroad and, and you know how people always ask you to sign their guest book. And um, <laughs> right. I, I acquired a stalker who had gone back and read somebody's guest book and gotten oh my, my address and actually took a train to another city to, to find my home. So be really careful about where you, you know, what kind of information, even talking in public, do not like really pay attention to what you say and what kind of information um, you're giving out there. 
Um, Do you guys carry samples of your photography as a way to sort of establish credibility as a photographer when you're in these situations? No, I, I, I do all my work in advance so that they know who I am well in advance and they respect who you are. I mean, just if you can uh, establish all of those contacts in advance, um, you're going to kind of land with, with people wanting you there. If you, know, you when they, have... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. No, no. No, I said if you happen to land into an emergency situation where you haven't been able to do the research, and this is going back to the person who would serve as your fixer, if you work with a fixer who is trusted by the community and who has all these contacts, that will be, that will put you in a position where, you know, even if you haven't done your research, this person knows where to go and what to do. Um, it, it, in the case you're not, it, you know, say somebody calls you, you have to get on a plane, you've got to go somewhere. If you go directly to, uh, you know, a local source of knowledge, they will be able to, to, to provide you with, with all of those years of, of you know, uh, contacts and background that you yourself might not be able to acquire because sometimes mm -hmm. you don't have time to to do it I mean hopefully in the best case scenario sometimes you will be able to do it but when when you don't uh, rely on 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 the fixer that we were talking about okay you know let me run through these um, these basic preparedness things so yeah. again um, accreditation get from find out what you need permissions for in advance it'll save you a lot of time on the ground and it will also alert you to things that you shouldn't be you know that you might not um, be allowed to photograph and and again get yourself in more trouble um, and one quick thing don't take pictures of like military <laughs> um, installations and, yeah. and things like that that's pretty basic but um, so have your accreditation and permissions there get your vaccinations research find out do you need anti-malarial medicines what do you need to, to stay healthy uh, Elizabeth mentioned this bring Cipro bring you know the the antidotes to um, you know common diseases or if you have allergies and EpiPen all of those things are really important even if you're a freelance journalist with very little money there um, there's great insurance NP um, NPPA actually has um, insurance for your cameras but I'm more interested in the health insurance and if you're going in conflict zones there's I used to use an insurance company I think called Bupa out of England and they covered those conflict zones but um, always have health insurance it's you know it's really it's you need it and you've got to that's another great budget. reason to join some of the, the trade organizations because they have negotiated health and equipment insurance exactly rates, right? exactly they do and I do have camera insurance and I encourage people to do it to get it it's it's gonna make your life a lot um, uh, <laughs> more you know you'll be able to endure in this business if you take all the proper steps um, have your emergency kit um, and then again we've been harping on the trustworthy guide but just so so important um, have when you're out in the field first of all have a local phone I always buy one of those I have one of these cheap Nokia phones prepaid. because prepaid phones because a couple of reasons one the battery lost much the battery lasts so much longer than these um, you know these these iPhones um, secondly people don't want to steal it right. and then the the prepaid um, then the prepaid uh, SIM card because then you you know you have a local number much cheaper and um, and then have those numbers of the hospitals and police in your phone in case something happens have and a list also, if not also written down yes exactly and also um, be in communication with someone outside wherever you're going and be in constant contact with them um, make an itinerary of your plans and send that to your trusted contact in case something happens and then finally wherever you go you know when I'm I never take when I'm going around I never take the same route I'm always moving in different ways and I don't have patterns so um, create an exit strategy don't have patterns to your daily routine if you're staying in a place for a week 
don't do the same thing every day. You know, kind of break things up so that you're you can't be followed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I want to go to, uh, I want to make sure we get to the last few slides because there's so many juicy topics, but let's go over some of these example situations, some of which you've, you've talked about before. So this happens a lot. I'll do one in Elizabeth, go for it. The, the taxi oh, yeah. drivers, very often you'll get in and their friend will be sitting there. They're like smiling, it's okay. And I say, no way, it's not okay. You have to get out. And then, um, you know, you, you, make, you make them get out. And um, just, <laughs> again, I always have my phone there so that they know that if they try anything, especially traveling at night, if you're coming from an airport, for example. And, and by the way, I don't go out at night. Like, I am pretty much a monk when I am working. I don't even go out to eat um, unless I have like really local friends there that I'm seeing. But um, I try to keep a very low profile if I'm alone in a place. I think something that, and this is something that we discussed in the past, uh, when, say, the situation with a taxi driver, be assertive. Mm -hmm. And yeah. not, not yeah. only with the taxi driver, don't, you know, don't think that, oh, I have to ingratiate myself. Well, maybe they know if you feel uncomfortable, you know, you do not want to put yourself in that. So be assertive and people will respond to that and back off. Definitely. And one more scenario that happened. Once I was in a taxi in Sierra Leone and a guy in fatigue stopped the car and it was dusk and he said, um, oh, come out, you need to meet my general or something. Um, show me your credentials. Happy and I general. said, <laughs> right. And I, and I just said, um, you know, let me see your credentials. Bring me your general. And I, and I basically then, um, he couldn't do, respond to that, and I told the driver to just drive yeah. and go. Don't wait and get yourself in those sticky situations. You know, we have an interesting question from someone, and, and uh, I, I know, Elizabeth, you talked about being in situations where you were groped. How, how do you get over kind of the, the psychological kind of post trauma effect, whether it was your, you, were, you were assaulted or you were groped or your equipment was broken? Um, in, you know, is it my, is it just kind of let it bounce off of you, or you, in, in, that... in in my case, I always think it. This is not about me. It's not yeah. personal. It's you know, and I basically, I mean, they could touch my. I know it's uncomfortable for somebody to grope you and so on, but I try to keep it in my mind that this is about documenting something which is important. And I'm, if somebody gropes me, I think. Look, this he isn't doing this to me. It's it's it has to do with a wider problem. What I try to do is I try to get away from from wherever it is that the groping is taking place. If I can confront the person, I can. You know, there are occasions, and this has happened both to a Amy and myself, where you could turn around and grab the hand. Sometimes it'll be just a kid, and mm -hmm. and shame them. You know, say, "Where is your father?" Um, you know, I, I, in, in um, certain situations, I would detect who would be kind of, you know, among the group of, if it, if it were younger kids that were doing this, um, and I, 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 I did this at one point, I would identify kind of like a little leader within the group that was doing the groping themselves and say, you know what, can I, can I, pay, you know, give you a few dinar or shekels or whatever it was that I was working for you to protect my back and I would hire him for the day right. and he would stand behind me with a hose literally like a plastic hose and you know and and try and um, send off people other kids that were trying to do that I mean and, and I did do that at, at one point or another but I, I would say just remember at every point that it's not personal mm -hmm. if yeah. you can can I throw in a couple of things about that yeah um, uh, don't be afraid to use your camera as a weapon when it gets really ugly. I have, you know, my Nikon D3S with the 70 heavy. to 200 is a heavy piece of equipment. And <laughs> sure I have is. not, <laughs> like, you know, I've hit people with it. And, um, you know, every situation is very different. And like Liz says, half the time it's like these little kids. And that's something else I want to talk about. Say you're like in a remote place and a couple of, this just happened to a friend of mine, um, Heidi Levine, like a couple of 12 year olds offered to carry her tripod. And then, you know, um, they, they were disgusting. And, and so don't assume that, and I've been attacked by a group of eight-year-olds in London. Oh. 
you know yeah. and and so don't ever look at these sweet little kids and sweet little faces and think that oh they're so harmless you know it it doesn't take many of them and and you don't know what their background and intentions are so don't put yourself in those places that seem harmless um and then, frankly, with the groping, I did get traumatized by it. I mean, I lived in places and got groped all the time, and I would literally go home and hibernate in my, you know, apartment for days and wouldn't want to go out and see people and seek help. Go get therapy if it's bothering yeah. you. Yeah. Like, it, Some, you know, it is traumatic. Something I would recommend, if possible, and, you know, each person is different, but if you can wait till you get to your hotel or wherever to break down try not to break definitely down and yeah, and, yeah. And don't do it in public place. absolutely because they will see they will and this sounds very macho and so on but if people see a weakness they will you know sometimes jump on it, 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 it i know it sounds very very hard but at, at times you know you want to show yourself as much as you can as solid and strong and not as you know, someone that they can victimize. Yeah, and I actually view it just like I view the wildlife out here in Montana. You know, do the yeah. same thing. Like if a bear is going to attack you, the first, you don't want to, but yeah, like you don't want to be like prey. You want to puff up exactly, and yeah. and you know slowly back away, <laughs> but, <Yeah. laughs> like, <laughs> confidently. This first point uh, on this this next slide, um, you know, when you're in different places where you might not have great internet, or you're afraid that the police or the military or somebody's going to take your stuff. How are you protecting your data? What do you guys do? I, I have I constantly back up my my information, you know, my disk as as often as I can. Uh, In multiple places, yeah. exactly. Also, change disks constantly and put put them. You know, I put them in my bra and my underwear. I put them in places where you know people won't access them. And also, something quite important: if you if you do that immediately start shooting some things around that might be inane because if somebody asks to take your material they're going to want to see something on the camera they're going to if they don't right. see anything on the camera they're going to say okay where's your disc and then they yeah. might try to search you that's right 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 and are you guys traveling with uh like an external hard drive is that how you're kind of you know, and when you're in the yeah. field for for a month, you have something you're dumping to. Definitely. Yeah. And multiple drives. Bring exactly. don't don't put it on just one drive. Minimum, bring two drives. Mm -hmm. Sometimes mm -hmm. even delete it from your computer because you know, in cases where there's a police state or what, they'll come in and they'll demand to see what's on your computer. Yeah. Sometimes they're they're they are quite tech tech technically savvy. savvy. Yeah. And they could go in and delete, yeah. So so definitely what um, Amy pointed out about bringing, you know, maybe not huge, you don't want a four terabyte, uh, um, you know, hard drive, but bring a couple smaller um, uh, hard drives. Yeah, there's tons of those little portable drives and, um, and put them in different places when you're packing up to leave. And frankly, if you have a colleague that's leaving earlier, um, you know, send send a drive out with them. Uh, Amy, why don't you take us through these last two points, because I think we've covered the, f the first four here, but behave very modestly and never drink, smoke, or disclose that you even do this at home. Yeah, I mean, I just, you know, you just, you, I mean, people have very different impressions of what, um, you know, especially Western women are, and they don't understand. Um, you know, I, 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 I think that they see a lot of really terrible TV and assume that everybody is loose and um, and if you do this it will reaffirm that and make you fair game to them exactly and that again back to the the question the rickshaw drivers always ask me ma'am do you drink whiskey you know they're not asking me if I drink whiskey they're asking me something else right they're trying to right. figure out what kind of woman I am and um, you know so, and, and I yeah sorry Elizabeth no 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 I was just gonna t uh, 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 refer to the last point as well, which is very important. It's a lead up to that. Um, in, in regards to not having a relationship, uh, an intimate relationship, when you're working on the field. Never. And and and, and that's because that's leverage or or. Uh, 
Well, it's how everybody. For, well, everybody's going to view you. You're not just you're having a relationship with the entire community, ah, not just yes, one yes. person. Yeah. And you know, you are there representing. You're there for work. You're not there for socializing and, um, you know, starting a relationship. Like it you will know, compromise you feel, your work. It absolutely will. If you feel this, yeah, and if you feel this great attraction, like come back and explore it another time in your life. <laughs> like, don't do it while you're in the middle of a job. Right, right. <laughs> so, so, yeah, there's, you know, I and one other thing is that, you know, it's about the whole thing about establishing relationships. Um, you know, often when you work with somebody over and over and over again they can develop crushes on you and mm -hmm. so you know it's just really important to draw a line like you know who you are why you're there and um, and, and maintaining that and don't blur the lines don't confuse people a lot of young photojournalists have you know historically thought that they have to be in dangerous situations and be shooting kind of cutting-edge stuff to, to gain their credibility and get their feet wet. What what's sort of the right way to go about doing that? Because obviously no one's going to stop doing that and we and we honestly need, you know, an American yeah. perspective or a female perspective or whatever cultural perspective on on these different situations. What's the best way for a young person to get into this? Well, it's funny when you were saying about needing to go to a conflict zone to or getting your feet wet. I I believe that you know the true skill of a photographer at, at times is shown when nothing is going on and you can make a picture out of nothing, out of a calm situation. I definitely don't think that you need to to go to an area where there's danger in order to make a good picture. And I think some of the best stories are done, you know, where where there's nothing going on. I don't know if Amy, if, if you... If well, the you more, yeah, the more conflict that I did, the more I realized that we need a very different perspective on this and that there are going to be plenty of people on the front lines. I feel like the, mu the much more underreported and frankly necessary stories are um, quieter, harder to tell, um, and and you know they they are being a woman you know we we are sort of uh, targeting women in this talk but you know there's the the whole female perspective in these these places um, so there's you know and and frankly you don't need to go to these conflict zones I really feel like there are really important a, a million great stories all around us just open your eyes and and you know do Sometimes, the research you know you can be you know, you can tell a story better in your local community. Start mm -hmm. start by telling the stories that are around you, where mm -hmm. you know you know you know the place. You can be your own fixer in these situations. And once you gain confidence and skill and knowledge, you could go on. You know, and and but uh, something I uh, I we were talking about earlier was that every story is a local story. So what better than to do, you know, something that is close to your heart and that you know well? Yeah, yeah, yeah no, that's a great point. And, and one last thing, you know, the whole American perspective thing you mentioned. I actually think I want to see local perspectives. And I, I see this beautiful emergence of lots of um, photographers from all of these different places um, who are bringing really a fresh eye. Um, and so... You know, I, I do encourage people to, to stay in their own backyard, and I, I was a hypocrite for so long, but you don't actually need to travel. But if you, you know, but if you are, make it unique. If you're going to travel across the world, find a story and make it really unique. Yeah, yeah. We've gone it's a little not, bit over, um, and I know that Amy and Elizabeth have mentioned a, a number of resources. We'll try to put those URLs up on the blog post tomorrow at blog.photoshelter.com, but I want to thank both uh, Amy and Elizabeth for, I mean, we could have talked for another three hours as far as I'm concerned. There's so much <laughs> information. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. Um, thank you so much, guys, for joining us today from Montana and London. Thank, thank you. you for having us. It's been yes. a pleasure.
And on a completely different topic, next week, Tuesday, uh, we have Michael Duvall from Lens Pro to Go talking about wedding preparedness, a completely Ooh. different topic, <laughs> slightly less dangerous, uh, <laughs> but I'm sure it will be as stimulating. So hopefully you'll join us for that. Again, this recording will be available on blog.photoshelter.com. And I want to thank the audience for joining us and going a little bit over today. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. <laughs>